Okay, welcome to Ream Troubleshooting. Today we're going to cover the code 11, 12, and 13, some of the more common codes with the tankless water heater. Even though the 11, 12, and 13 are common, there are multiple different scenarios that can cause those codes. So let's cover some troubleshooting steps so that we can effectively determine what is causing the issue. All right, today we've got Kim on the line and she's going to help walk us through some of these codes. Now, uh, when you do have a code, one of the things that you're going to want to check is going to be your gas piping, uh, your gas pressures, and also your venting. Now this particular heater is in use right now and we've already verified that the venting and the gas pressure are proper. So those aren't necessarily going to be an issue, but we're going to go ahead and show you how to check those as well. So Kim, I've got a code 11. How would you like me to proceed today? Is the code 11 happening every time we turn the faucet on or just intermittently? Uh, Kim, the code 11 is consistently happening all the time. Okay, uh, so we're going to want to take the front cover off the unit and check that uh, for flame or spark in that little sight glass window. Okay, <laughs> I'll go ahead and take this cover off. There's six Phillips head screws on the front of this unit. Now as I take these out, I'll have to put these someplace safe so that I don't lose them. I also want to note that when you do remove all of these screws on this panel, it's not necessarily hung in place, meaning it may not hang there under its own power. So when you get to that last screw, I like to put a little pressure on the front of the panel so it doesn't fall off. Okay, six screws are removed and there's our front panel. Okay, we'll go ahead and set that off to the side. All right, Kim, what's my next step? Okay, so you're gonna wanna locate the sight glass window. Uh, if you can't see the sight glass window, you might need to uh, kind of lift up that uh, little plastic wrap ever so slightly so that you can see that sight glass window. Okay, I'll move this out of the way. Now this plastic wrap that's around the water heater, if it's in my way, can I just cut it out? No, sir, you cannot cut it out. We need that to stay intact. Okay. If you cut it, it will permanently disable the water heater. All right. We'll notate that. Do not damage the plastic wrapping or the water heater will be disabled. Okay. Now to check for spark, you want me to go ahead and run some water and watch through that sight glass, correct? Okay, you're going to want to lean hard to the left and look hard to the right to see if you can see that spark because it can be difficult to see if you're trying to look straight on. I see. Okay, so the spark is going to be coming from your igniter rod, which is right here to the right. So you'll want to look hard left, hard right, I'm sorry. And here we go. Let's see if we can get anything. Okay, so I've got the OHL moved out of the way. I'm going to look hard to the right through this sight glass. Okay. <clears throat> I do not see a spark. Okay. Now for this, when a caller says they still don't see a spark looking through the sight glass window, you're really going to want to double check it because it can be very difficult to see that spark through the sight glass window, particularly and especially if it is in an outdoor application where sunlight's hidden around it. Okay. So now I'm going to have to do an external spark test. Okay. So I'm going to have you locate the igniter coil. It's over on the right hand side of the cabinet. It's a little black box with a thick black wire sticking out of the top of it. Okay. I want you to follow that thick black wire up to where it connects onto the igniter rod and tug it off of the igniter rod. Got it. Okay, it's disconnected. Now there's a metal tip to that wire. Don't touch the metal tip with your fingers. We don't want you to electrocute yourself. But hold it within about a quarter of an inch of something metal, close but not touching. And then try to activate the heater and see if you see a spark between the metal and the igniter coil. Okay. And do you want me to actually produce a spark or no? If you can. Yeah, I can. Just don't touch 
it with your fingers. I won't. I already <laughs> shocked myself enough on Kitarami. Okay, here we go. We're going to do the external spark test. Well, Kim, it looks like we've got plenty of spark. Okay, awesome. That's cool. So let's, let's go with a scenario where we don't have spark first. Okay. Um, okay, here we go. External spark test. No spark coming from the coil. All right. So the next thing I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you uh, connect the voltmeter to the two gray wires under that uh, igniter coil and check to see if you've got voltage going through it when the unit is trying to ignite. Okay, we're going to check the power coming from the power control board to the coil on these two gray wires. This is the plug that plugs into the coil. We're gonna be looking for AC volts. I show them where to check it on both ends. Okay, which one do you wanna start with? At the plug or like at the- Like they can check it on the circuit board or they and they can check it right at the plug up underneath. But we never wanna have them stick the leads in the, in the top of the connector and the, where it plugs in, because they could damage it. Okay, I'll go from the back. We'll do it the right way here, not the Rick way. Always in the back of the connector. Okay, we're gonna check our AC volts to our coil. We can do that here at the plug to the coil. And it's safer to go ahead and test from the back of the plug so you don't damage the connector. Or you can do the connector H here. It's got two gray wires, two white wires. This is also a place you can check for your AC volts. So we're gonna start here. And if you have a multimeter, you're gonna wanna use some fine point tips. It makes it a lot easier. You can buy those or you can make them. Okay, we're not showing any. Let's test this out real quick here. Okay, we're not showing any power here coming to the coil, so we'll go ahead and next check at the power control board. We should get 120 volts, right? Yes, we're looking for 120 volts, anywhere between 109 to 132 voltage of AC current. So. Oh. Okay. Uh, let's go and ahead. Make sure they are trying to activate the heater when doing so, because otherwise the voltage will not be going through those gray wires to the igniter coil. It is only during the ignition phase. Perfect. All right. No power here. Now we're going to check over here at connector H. And we're going to go on the gray wires. We're going to activate the heater and we'll see if we get any power. Okay. We do not have power at connector H. To the coil. Okay, so in this scenario, we don't have any power coming from the control board to the igniter coil during the ignition phase, which means that we need to replace the water, the power control board. Okay, power control board is this whole assembly here, correct? Yes. Okay. Okay, so no power to coil, no spark, no power at connector H. We know that we've got a problem here at the control board. Excellent. All right. Now, if we do have power to the control board, from the control board to the igniter coil, but we have no response and no spark out of the igniter coil, then the issue is to replace the igniter coil. Okay, let's review that real quick. If we do have power here, gray wires, connector H, we will have 120 volts AC power when the heater is attempting to ignite, correct? Correct. Okay, so if power here, yes, power here, yes. However, you cannot get a spark, then your coil will need to be replaced. And that is this black box here. 
It is held in by one Phillips head screw and it leads up and is also held up here by another screw and plugged into the igniter coil. I'm sorry, the igniter rod. Okay. Well, Kim, I've got a code 12. <laughs> All right. Well, so what happens uh, when you go to ignite the heater? What happens? Well, <clears throat> when I go to ignite the heater, I can see through the sight glass that the heater does in fact light. However, it immediately, it, it immediately goes out. So I'm going to get you to turn the incoming water supply off in the water heater. All right, incoming water supply is off. Okay, and go ahead and turn the remote off. All right. And I want you to press and hold the up and down arrow keys at the same time until one E pops up. One E. Okay. And use the, oh, okay. In this scenario, you got to disconnect the translator. Sorry. Oh, stupid. Oh. Don't tell anybody that, but you, you disconnect it from the circuit board. Okay. Well, that's, that's it. Actually, that's yeah, good. That we'll, we'll, we'll leave that in the video. We'll leave that in the video and tell them. So I've got one E to pop up. However, it, it went out. I do have a translator plugged in, so we're going to need to unplug that before we proceed. So let's try that again now that the translator's unplugged. There we go. Now it's showing our one E and it's also flashing our code 12. Okay, now use the up arrow key only and change the letter E to a letter Y. If you miss the letter oh, Y, I missed it. the up arrow key and it'll go back around. Okay, so just keep hitting it till I get to Y, and if I miss it, go back around. All right, I am now at one Y. And now we're gonna use the down arrow key to change the number to zero. And what happens if I miss the zero? You can just keep hitting the down arrow key and it'll go back around. Beautiful. Zero Y. So right now, zero Y is showing zero zero, which yes. is perfectly fine considering we are not attempting to activate the water heater at any point. Okay. So what we're going to do here is we're going to check the flame rod status. When the entire, when we first ignite the heater, the entire burner lights up. So what we should see in a good scenario is the water heater, uh, the zero Y should jump to zero five. Now, depending on how much water flow we have moving the heater, it may dial back to zero one, and that's perfectly okay, but we really wanna try and make sure that they see that zero five, uh, five on that initial startup. Okay, all right, so <clears throat> to check this, what I've done to make it easier for one person, if you're a homeowner or a technician, is I have a faucet on downstairs. Oh, Let's backtrack real quick. Okay. I forgot one step in the procedure. Okay. Press the power button on the display one time quickly. Now we have to, we always have to make sure we activate the water heater so it makes the ignition attempt while we're in maintenance mode. Okay, so we've gone into maintenance mode, gone down to our settings, but we're gonna need to turn the remote back on so that we get a uh, reading in real time with the water heater trying to fire. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, good. Now I have a faucet on so that I can control the water heater with the incoming shutoff valve. So when I've got it off, it's off. I can turn the, the water back onto the unit and it will attempt to fire since I have a faucet on. Easy way to do that if you're the only person working on it. You don't have to have a separate person turning water on and off. This works out well. Okay, so we're at zero Y. I've got the controller on. Are we ready to go ahead and test and see what we're gonna get? Yes. All right, here we go. Do you have the gas on? Mm -mm. 
No, do you want me to do it? I just had it to where it was going to give us no reading. Hey, I need that faucet on. Y'all just turned it off. Who did? It's off. Someone turned it off. I have zero flow going through my heater. Hot side only. She didn't even listen to me, so I'm going to... Pop it open and close it. The reason why I don't like doing that is because sometimes water sprays out through around the top of it. That's true. Turn the display off, press and hold the up and down arrow keys at the same time until one E pops up. Use the up arrow key to change the letter E to a letter Y. And the down arrow key to change the number to zero. And press the power button on the display one time quickly to activate the heater. It's very important that you tell the uh, caller when they turn the water supply on, they need to be looking at that remote to see that zero five come up. All right, let's do that. Let's turn the water on, light this water heater up and see what we get on the flame rods. Five, one. Just like that, one flash of a five, then a flash to the one. Right, so the entire burner did light up. So as long as you get that initial zero five, that's perfectly all right. Okay. If the contractor's not convinced, then you can also have them increase flow, turn multiple fixtures on to get it to go into high fire. So zero one indicates that flame rod one, which is that middle flame rod, that that one is detecting. When you go to zero five, the flame rod two is also detecting flame. So both flame rods are detecting flame. Flame rod two only comes on when the unit goes into medium to high fire. So otherwise it is not needed and will not be registering flame. So it's okay if it says zero one. Perfect. Now, I want you to flip the M and the T connectors on the circuit board. Okay, M and T, the blue and white connectors are reversed on the circuit board. So in some cases, if a contractor says that they have serviced the flame rods or replaced the flame rods, Go in doing this check. It's very important what we're going to see next. So go ahead and turn the water supply on. Okay. So it went to zero five, zero five, and zero zero. So it's kind of a really interesting concept there. So go ahead and turn the water supply off. Well, that's the blue wire. You want me to disconnect the blue? I mean, the, the white? Yes, disconnect the white one. And leave them reversed? Or you want the blue one back where it's supposed to go? Put the blue one back where it's supposed to go. Okay. All right, so now we just have the... We've got the flame rod two back where it goes on the power control board. Flame rod one is disconnected from the control board. You don't have to turn it this way. Okay. 
All right, flame rod one disconnected, flame rod two is connected. All right, now go ahead and turn the water on. Now you're reading zero four. Yep. On yes, sir. So that tells you there is an issue. If you see anything other than a zero five or zero one, there is an issue somewhere. And a zero four indicates that the flame rod two is detecting flame, but flame rod one is not detecting flame. So what we want to do is ask the contractor to verify that the flame rods are plugged into the correct location. Perfect. And we can do that by matching the colors up here and reseating the plugs. Make sure we've got a good positive connection. And then up and this here. This is particularly important with outdoor units that only have the one flame rod. Because one flame rod, they could potentially plug it into two different ports. If they plug it into the wrong port, then they will get an error code 11. And they could, or even a 12. Uh, because it's not detecting the on the right flame rod connector. Ah, okay, outdoor units, one flame rod, it is possible to connect it to the wrong connector. Excellent. Now, if you do see a zero, zero, so if you do see a zero, zero on zero Y, while the flame is on, and it never goes to zero, five or zero, one, you'd want to recommend that they were uh, they either clean or replace those flame rods. Always opt for cleaning over replacement because more often than not, you can just clean them up using some emery cloth or a light grit sandpaper. Okay. If they are plugged into the right, right spot, but you get a zero four, then one of the flame rods, particularly flame rod one, can't detect the flame. So you need to probably go ahead and pull that one and clean it might as well go ahead and clean the other ones. If that still does not solve the issue, then at that point you would recommend replacement of the flame rods. All right, so let's check one of these flame rods. We'll do flame rod one, two Phillips head screws. Okay, we'll just wiggle that out a little bit there. And as you can see, with the flame rod removed, there is an exposed metal tip here, and you can use the sandpaper or emery cloth, like Kim stated, get that cleaned up, and it'll be like new. It's important to note that there is a fine little white gasket here, and that is important to inspect. Now this one seems to be okay, but let's say it was ripped and I've just ripped this one for demonstration purposes, that right there could potentially cause a problem. If this, if this gasket is not in there or it's ripped, it's very easy for the OHL to become damaged. So what you wanna do is, there's some spare filters, I'm sorry. There are some spare gaskets that come with your heater on the lower right hand side, they're taped to the side. And we'll go ahead and open this up, get a new gasket and reinstall this. If they've already used their gaskets and need a new set of flame rod gaskets, they can certainly purchase those flame rod gaskets as a separate entity. Perfect. And when they... We definitely want to recommend that they replace the flame rod gaskets whenever they pull those flame rods out. Okay, and if we need to get new gaskets, can we order those online or do we need to go to a local supplier? They can be ordered either through the local wholesaler or through your website at parts.ream.com. Parts.ream.com, excellent. Now, this opening is not complete square. It's got a curved end on the gasket as well as a flame rod. So just match that shape up and wiggle it back in and reinstall your screws.
too much coffee this morning. Okay, new gasket, flame rod back in. And we're gonna go ahead and connect it. Now you can see through this rubber boot that's protecting it. However, it's not completely clear. So you wanna make sure you get that snapped on there properly. If you miss the connection, it may appear to be connected. And if it's not, you'll get the code. All right, so we're back in business here. Now what are we gonna do? Okay, so now if we've checked the igniter coil, everything's working fine on that front. We've got flame, we've got ignition, but we can't get, still can't keep the unit running. Uh, checking the flame rods. Flame rods are detecting flame just fine. Our next step is gonna be to check that gas valve and the circuit board. Okay. So we're gonna have to ask the contractor to pull out his meter. The multimeter? Yeah. Okay, now what In if a contractor, scenario, what if the contractor doesn't have a multimeter? Then we are not going to be able to effectively test the gas valve or the circuit board because in this instance, we have to get those resistance readings. We have to get those voltage readings. So we're going to ask, we're gonna, I would start with the gas valve resistance check. Okay. This gets the contractor familiar with the test procedure that we're going to run and gets us ready for doing that voltage check. Okay. So we say, okay, go ahead and turn the heater off. Yeah. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna check resistance to the gas valve solenoid. So we need to have the meter set to uh, read resistance or ohms. Okay. And so there's a big connector right in the middle of the board. It's an eight pin connector missing one wire. Okay, right in the middle, very big one. I think it's the largest one. Yes. Excellent. That's it right is. here. Okay. Okay. So what we're going to do, we're going to use the black wire as our common. Now we do need to keep this connected to the circuit board, all circuits connected, because a load versus an unloaded wire, it reads very differently as far as resistance goes. So in this case, we need a fully loaded wire. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the black wire as our common and we're going to check a resistance across each of the different color wires, ignoring the green wire because it's a ground wire. So we don't care about the green wire. So we're going to use the black wire as our common and we're going to check resistance across each of the different color wires, ignoring the green wire because that's a ground wire. So we don't really care about that one. But we're going to check black to red, black to blue, black to white, black to gray, black to yellow. Okay. Now, so we're going to check black with the, as a common and we're going to go across each wire. So now how do we effectively do that? Do we just light the water heater and then start probing different wires? No, during a resistance check, we do not want any power supplied to the water heater. And that's why we want to make sure the customer turns the water heater off, turns the water supply off to ensure that the water heater will not activate and will not light. Because if you do have voltage going through a, a wire that you're testing with a voltmeter, you could damage and destroy your voltmeter. Okay. All righty. And as far as resistance, what range should we be looking at? What we're going to be looking for here on the range is going to be 0.8 to 2.4 K ohms. So we're looking, it's not a very high resistance, but we're looking for that resistance to be within that range value. Okay. So on the red wire, we're getting 1.2. On the blue wire, 1.2. On the yellow wire, 1.5. Okay, on the white wire, 1.2. And I think our last one is our gray wire, 1.2. Okay, so now all those values sound really correct. Now let's go with the one with the idea that perhaps we have one that reads OL. Okay. 
So let's if say... If we have one wire reading OL, a couple things to consider here. Make sure the contractor has the leads firmly in place in the back of that connector. Mm -hmm. Because if you, if you got it slightly out, if you're not making contact with the metal inside the back of that connector, you're not going to get the proper resistance reading. Yes, and as I mentioned, these fine tip leads make it a lot easier. Without these... Now, if they can't get their needle leads in the back of the connector, I usually recommend that they get either a thin piece of wire or a paper clip. Something metal to go back in there that they can make contact with the back of that plug. All right, excellent. So we've got to make sure that we've got good connection, otherwise we will get the OL. Okay, so let's say we get an OL on one of the wires um, and we do have good connection. If we do have good connection, we're still getting OL on one of the wires, then we're going to need to replace the gas valve in this scenario because that one solenoid is not opening. Ah, excellent. So black is a common check our ohms with the water heater off on each of the wires, leaving the green wire out. And if anything reads OL, then we're gonna replace the gas valve. Okay. Now, uh, for this, locate the uh, gas valve resistor itself. Which solenoid is it coming off of? Hang on a second, I'll pull, I'll pull the... I'll pull the wiring diagram. Okay, should be coming off that black to gray solenoid. I think that's the one in the front. Um, so follow that black wire. My you should be able to find that resistor. From connector uh, K? Or no, uh, find the... The solenoid with the gray black wire. Find the solenoid that has the gray black wire attached to it. And is it clipped on to the copper pipe? Um yeah, there she is. It is clipped on to the copper pipe, isn't it? Yes. Okay. All right. So now if this gas valve solenoid, so if you're doing your resistance check, they are we're sure they're making contact in the back of that plug and every single one of the solenoids is reading as an open circuit we would want to replace this little gas valve resistor okay the resistor goes along the black wire if there's any damage or failure to that resistor then it will break the contact on the black wire so only one side is okay, whereas the other side won't be. So it will not allow voltage to be received by the gas valve. Now, can we test this resistor? The resistor, really, it's more about visual inspection. But again, our test on the gas valve will determine if that piece is good or bad. Because the only time that that is an option is if every single solenoid reads as an open circuit. Okay. So if every single solenoid reads as an open circuit, we're gonna point all of our attention to that guy right there. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Now where? Okay, so our next step with the contractor, if, the, if, all, the volta, if all the resistance readings work out on the gas valve, we're going to switch over and do the same exact test. So we're gonna, I'm going to have you do the same test, only this time we're going to check DC voltage. It's very important to make sure that they set their meter on DC voltage. And we want to make sure, too, that the contractor does a little setup first because he's going to need to be in front of the water heater when he's making these test runs. So we need to make sure that a faucet is turned on somewhere and left open so that he can cut the water on and off at the heater. When doing these voltage checks, 
we're only going to do it on initial ignition sequence. We do not want to just switch around, let the heater light, because more often than not, the reason why we're testing it is it may or may not be staying lit to begin with. What we're trying to do is just get that initial voltage. Remember, just like with the flame rods going to zero five, when the whole, when the unit first ignites, the entire burner lights up, which means every gas solenoid is going to open. Okay. Now, are we going to use our black as a common again? We're going to do the exact same test. Black wire is the common. We're going to check the DC voltage this time across each of the different color wires. Okay. So, here's how I like to do this. And this is how Kim has taught me to do this. I'm going to go ahead and connect one wire so my test is ready. And get your leads in place. Yes. And then when you're ready to go, turn the water on, watch your meter for that voltage reading. All right. Our test is ready to go. Let's fire it up and see what we get on the red wire. <laughs> i got to plug it in there. Okay. I'm going to do that one more time. Looks like it starts off at, it's setting at 107. Okay. So that's a good reading. So what we're looking for here when we're doing the test is we're looking for anywhere from 108 to 120. Let me double check this. I'm going to restart that. So in this, uh, we're looking for DC voltage range between 90 to 120 DC volts. Okay, 90 to 120, and I'm going to shut the water off, pick a new wire. In turn. between each wire test. So yeah, it's very important that we turn the water on, get our voltage reading, turn the water off, okay. and move to the next wire, and right. repeat the process. Okay, water's off. Test is ready on blue wire. Water on, 107. Water off, gray wire. Water on, 107. Water off. Test is ready for white wire. All right, water on. 107 and we'll go water off test ready for yellow wire water on 107 okay so now i want to kind of point out uh some of the problems you can run into if the contractor tries to skip turning the water off and on in between the wire test and just switching between the two wires so what we're going to do is we're going to have the con this contractor, Ricky, mm -hmm. we're going to have him checking the gray wire and then move directly to the blue wire without cutting the heater off. Okay, we got 13.9 on the gray, 13.9 on the blue. So see, when, when, he, when you're moving around on the wire, okay, this is 13.9, that doesn't make sense, it's not right. 
Well, on the red, I've got 107, yellow 107, um, white 13.6, gray 13. So, yeah. So if you get an odd reading from it, always double check on that one wire that's getting a funky reading because it may just be that the contractor skipped turning the water off and back on again to get that initial startup voltage. Yes, yes, I can if definitely see that. If you get that voltage on initial startup, then we need to be replacing the circuit board. Okay. Because it's not sending the proper voltage to that solenoid. But then, again, we always want to double check. Another issue that we run into from time to time is a contractor setting his meter on the wrong setting. Mm. We have to be reading DC voltage here. But look what happens, what kind of reading you get, if Ricky has his meter set on AC voltage. Let's see. Fifty-two. So that doesn't sound right. That fifty-two doesn't sound right, and it might trick you into thinking that the circuit board's bad. But you always want to double check with the contractor. Are you sure you have it set on DC volts and not AC volts? Because if they do have it set on AC, it's going to read something wildly different, and it's not going to sound even remotely right. Yeah, that's true. If I were uh, testing this on the wrong setting and I read 52, I would definitely assume that I've got a problem there. So the final test we can do for that gas valve and circuit board is on a different connector. So we're going to locate connector R. Connector R is located to the right of those black boxes right in the middle of the board. Okay, and it looks like we've got a uh, blue, white, yellow, red, black, black, and a red wire to the connector R. Okay, so this connector houses multiple items. So the top bit is going to be all the thermistors in the heater. That's where their final connection point is. Now that bottom red and black wire goes to our proportional gas flow regulator or PGFR valve. So that's the main valve that opens up inside that water heater to allow gas into the gas valve to begin with. So if there is something wrong with that PGFR valve, then it's not going to light at all. So when you get a contractor that's saying, I do have spark, but I don't have any flame, this is going to be an integral step to check and see if that PGFR valve is going to be opening. Okay. So we're also going to do the exact same thing we did on the solenoids. We're going to check resistance first and then voltage second. Okay, now with resistance, we want power off, right? Yes, we definitely want to make sure we have the power off. We're not allowing the heater to fire up. Okay, so we do have this water heater powered off. We will check resistance on the bottom red and black wires. Now this resistance range is going to be a little bit different than the solenoids. What we're looking for is anywhere from 40 to 80 ohms, not K ohms, 40 to 80 ohms. So it's very important that when they have their meter set, they have it set on the lowest possible ohm reading setting they have on their meter. Okay, and Kim, this one is an auto ranging meter, so I can almost set it and forget it on that aspect. And I did want to note, these wires are small, and if you do not have that fine tip on there, you're going to have a very difficult time getting in there. So. I'm able to read 63 ohms. 
Okay, so that tells us that it's good because it is between that 40 to 80 ohms that we were looking for. So next we're going to go ahead and check the DC voltage. Again, we're on DC voltage. And we're going to do this on the initial startup. Okay, and my meter, as I change it, it will tell you on the screen AC or DC. But I also want to note that the little visual here with the sine wave right here for the AC and then the um, solid line with the dashed line for the DC. So that's how mine and some of the others may be set up. So don't let those confuse you. But we're going to go to DC volts and we're going to power the heater on. Okay, so I've got the heater on and it's, it's at rest right now. It's not calling for any heat. Okay, should I be getting zero? Yes. Okay. Because we are not at all firing right now. The, uh, the control board only sends the voltage when the unit is attempting to ignite here. Okay. Well, perfect. So I've got the heater at rest, testing the wires, and we're at zero. Should we go ahead and fire the heater up and see what we get? Yes. Okay, jumped up when it first lit. Now it seems to be sitting at right at about 1 1.7, 1 1.6, 1.8, 1.9. Yeah, see, I've noticed that the meter jumps around a little bit, and that's okay. That doesn't indicate that there's anything faulty there. What we're really looking for is that voltage to stay within the appropriate range. In this scenario, with this particular set of wiring, is also different. We should be getting anywhere between 1.5 to 14 DC volts. Okay. So any, anything in between that range is perfectly fine. If it is a little bit lower than the range, that's okay. Because you got to make some uh, liberty for calibration of the meter. Uh, same thing if it goes a little on the high side, you know, if it's, you know, 15 volts or some DC, then that's perfectly all right, because that could just be his meter's calibration. Okay. So we had uh, 1.8. If, if we're reading zero, so if we're getting the, if we're getting the incorrect resistance, we're going to replace the gas control valve. So if we're reading an open circuit on that R connector, we're going to replace the gas control valve. If we're reading incorrect voltage or no voltage to that gas valve, then we're going to replace the circuit board. Okay, and I was at 1.8 to 2, so I'm within that range. So we're going to assume that this is good. <laughs> Now, let's say you've done all these tests and everything checks out. What's next, Mr. Plummer? Well, well, we've pretty much eliminated the components that could lead to that error code 11, 12, and 13. Mm -hmm. We've checked the flame rod. They're checking good. Igniter coil is activating, sending a spark as it's supposed to. The gas valve solenoids are all opening the way they should. The circuit board is sending the voltage where it's supposed to be sending voltage. Okay. So now we've pretty much eliminated the water heater as the culprit for any of these codes. Now we're into the environmentals. Okay. We need to check our venting, check our gas supply pressure. We want to double check that. So it's okay if a contractor says yeah yeah everything's fine with the gas pressure venting's fine okay well if that's the case let's get into the component checks 
if the components all check out, then we have to circle back around and revisit that gas pressure and revisit that venting. Now, if I want to check my gas pressure, where am I going to do that from? We're going to check it. We're not going to check it on the gas valve. Now, yes, the gas valve does have a little fork that you could potentially use to check manifold pressure. But remember, this is a modulating gas valve. It's also a negative pressure gas valve. So it's not going to read anything intelligible to a contractor. Uh, and it's going to just pull what it needs to pull. As long as those solenoids are checking out and doing their job, there's no reason to assume that anything is awry with the gas valve. So, so we're only going to want to check it on the inlet side. And we provided a port on the inlet side. Now, some older models, they didn't have the port on the inlet gas valve. But on the newer models, you've got a little screw port with a Phillips head screw in it. Loosen that screw up, hook a manometer up to it, and then check that gas pressure. And now it's very important when you're checking the gas pressure, you check not only the static pressure, but also the dynamic pressure. Get the heater to fire up into full fire, which means you're going to have to turn on a lot of other fixtures in the house to get that water heater to go into high fire. And make sure the gas pressure is not dropping below the minimum requirement. Now, if you need to know the minimum requirement, that can be found on the side of the water heater on the rating plate. It tells you what your minimum inlet gas pressure is and what your maximum inlet gas pressure is. Now, if I'm testing gas pressure and I also have a pool heater, two furnaces and a fireplace on my gas system and I suspect that I'm losing gas supply that's causing the issue with my heater, should I check the dynamic pressure with those units going as well? Absolutely. If you have an undersized gas line, for instance, and you've got your furnace kicking on, it could starve your water heater for gas because it's going to pull all that gas away from the water heater. Absolutely. So another thing to take a look at, especially when you're dealing with the RTGH-2 models, is may asking them how long that vent run is. Mm -hmm. Now, we've established this vent is okay, but let's say that I have a 45-foot vent run. How many elbows do you have on that vent run? Well, I've got about six. Okay, so we've got six. So now you want to take a look at your use and care manual. Your use and care manual gives you kind of the maximum vent lengths that you can run. Now remember on the dash two models, if you adjust the A2 setting, you can have a longer vent run. So now if we have 40 feet with six elbows, we're still within the maximum restriction, but we do need to make sure that number two dip switch on the bottom row of dip switches is in the up position so that it can recognize that longer vent run. If they don't have that dip switch set up, they could experience a lot of error code 12s and maybe even potentially some error code 11s. And you said the dip number two, which is the bottom bank, switch number two? Yes. And if you've got a long vent run, it goes up. Yes, and that will stay in the up position. That will allow the heater to basically modify itself to accept that longer vent run on two inch venting. Now, another thing to take into consideration is your altitude. It's always a good idea to double check with the customer, what altitude are you at? If they are higher than 2000 feet, they are going to have to make an altitude adjustment on the water heater. Now, depending on the age of the water heater, you'll want to consult the use and care manual as to what range goes to which, because the older models could go up to a higher altitude, mm -hmm. and our newer models have reduced the amount of altitude. So we're going to go with the current product right now. 
And on your altitude setting, if you're above 5,200 or above 2,000 feet, but under 5,200 feet, uh, the, did I say 5,400 or 5,200? I don't remember. 54. Let me double check because I want to make sure this is right. I think it's 5,400. Okay, it is 5,400, but 8,500. Okay, so let's start that sequence over, don't we? I know. Okay. Okay. So you also want to check that, uh, the altitude setting. So if they're above 2,000 feet, but below 5,400 feet, then you'll flip the number, the dip to number three switch to the up position. Okay. If they're above 5,400 feet, but below 8,500 feet, then you'll flip the number four dip switch up on dip two instead of the number three. Okay, so it's either or. Yes. Gotcha. Okay, perfect. Now, if they have the water heater installed above 8,500 feet, we cannot make any further adjustment on the heater, and we cannot guarantee proper operation of the water heater at altitudes higher than 8,500 feet. Are there any areas that are above 8,500 feet that we deal with? In Colorado. Colorado. Okay. Good to know. Any high mountainous areas, uh, some places in California maybe, uh, but mostly mostly in just high mountainous areas. Okay. Well, that's going to conclude our 11, 12, and 13 testing. We're going to go ahead and get this water heater put back together and in service, and we'll see you next time.